My name is Natalie Smolensky. I lead business development for Learning Machine Technologies, which is a software firm that makes applications for issuing and verifying official documents using the blockchain as a secure anchor of trust. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to give you a, a brief overview of what the blockchain is and then talk about its applications for education in particular. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Alex Grech, uh, from the government of Malta, which is the first nation in the world to announce a national pilot of blockchain credentials in education. And uh, after my introductory presentation, Dr. Grech will speak more uh, about the Malta pilot as well. We're going to leave 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A, um, so please do feel free to uh, write down any questions you have during our presentation and, and share them with me. Uh, we are also located at the Bloxerts booth, which is just around the corner. So after the presentation, if you want to talk one-on-one -on -one with either myself or Dr. Greg, feel free to walk with us to the booth. It's a beautiful lounge. We can sit down, have a cup of coffee, and, and talk more. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I'm actually a cultural anthropologist by background. So what interests me about technology is its social utility. How does technology transform society? And, and this is where the blockchain is one of the biggest innovations that we have seen in the past several decades. Um, the first thing I want to do to contextualize why the blockchain is so important for society is to give you a little bit of background about how human beings have used ledgers historically. So how have we kept track of things? Um, so this image that you're seeing here is from a recent trip that uh, Learning Machine uh, and I made to Sasfe, Switzerland, which is a small village in the Swiss mountains. And these are the ledgers that the people of Sasfe would use to keep track of who in their community had been contributing what to their collective existence. So whether it was making clothes, uh, bringing in firewood, uh, collecting ice, th there, was, there was a list of community duties and obligations, and people had to be current uh, in their contributions to the society in order to remain in good standing socially. So they used these, these ledgers, these um, little pieces of wood connected to strings to keep track of who was doing what. This, is, this may look like an ancient technology, but in fact, these are just from the 19th century. This is actually very recent. Um, human beings have been using ledgers to, uh, to document their social contributions since time immemorial. And so that's what I want to talk about right now. This, what you're looking at here, is a kipu uh, string. A kipu was used by the Incan people to keep track of materials um, and labor. So each of these strings represented something different that was being kept track of, um, whether it was uh, a certain type of animal, beast of burden, a type of grain, um, a type of person even, say uh, young women of marriageable age, all of these were documented using these knots. And every knot in these strings represents a quantity. Now, anthropologists have had a tough time deciphering what exactly these kipu knots were keeping track of because we've lost the code or the cipher to make sense of them. But we have pretty good guesses that these were actually imperial instruments of accounting that were very important to the ongoing administration of social life in the Inca Empire. So I want to take a few steps back. Um, how, how did we come to the ledger as such a fundamental social technology? You know, this need to keep account of transactions, of who is giving what to whom, who is receiving what in return, um, and, and devising a, a set of tools, of technologies, of social technologies to remember that, to keep that in collective memory. I want to take you all the way back to Neolithic Mesopotamia. So we're talking about you know, 10,000 years before the Common Era. It's around this time that we start seeing a new technology arise in uh, the Fertile Crescent. And it's these tokens. 
So people started exchanging tokens, which were little representations of a particular good or service. So every token represents something different. It's, it's not uh, easy to see what they are in this, in this image, but I can share this image with, with anyone who's interested later. So again, whether we're talking about um, an ox or uh, grain, wheat, barley, all of these were represented with tokens, and people would collect tokens to keep track of um, who had given them what. Now, over time, people figured out that instead of exchanging physical tokens, you could actually just create a representation of the token on a piece of clay. So you could take that token and press it into the clay and have a mark, um, a symbol, that would represent the transaction. And it wasn't too big of a leap from there to then just start drawing the symbols on pieces of clay to begin with. And so this is actually how writing arose. Our first human alphabets evolved from these ledgers that were documenting the exchange of goods and services between people. So ledgers evolved quite considerably since, since ancient Mesopotamia. One of the most fundamental innovations in the ledger occurred in 14th century Florence when merchants started doing something called double entry bookkeeping. What this meant is that you had a series of credits on one side of the ledger and debits on the other side of the ledger. And there was a standard practice of recording each transaction and then balancing the credits and debits. This is still the system of accounting in use today. It powers the world economy. It's hard to overstate how important double entry bookkeeping has been to the evolution, not just of markets, but of human society. And you can see from, um, from this example, this is, this is the uh, ledger of Peppo degli Albisi, a Florentine wool merchant, and he had a diary in which he was keeping his ledger of business transactions together with his personal notes, his personal life. So this was um, a, a symbol for the interconnection of economy and household. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't possible to strictly separate account keeping from personal social life. Now, I, I want to tell you a story um, that comes directly from the anthropological tradition about the power of ledgers. So this is anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. Uh, Lévi-Strauss was one of the greatest anthropologists of the 20th century. Uh, he was Belgian born. He ended up uh, making his career in the United States after the Second World War. And he specialized in the study of Amazonian tribes. So uh, at one point in his career, he wanted to conduct a census of the Nambiquara tribe. The Nambiquara tribe were, were a very small tribe of people in the Amazon who um, had not had much contact with uh, the world beyond their circle of villages. Could we find out what that sound is? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so the Nambiquara were a small tribe of people who hadn't had much contact with the outside world. And Levi Strauss wanted to take a census. He wanted to know how many people there were in this village. So what he did was he set out with a, with a whole uh, basket full of gifts and went deep into the Amazonian rainforest on a mission with this tribe. Now, uh, he was guided by the leader of the small band of Indians that he was staying with. And uh, during the course of Levi Strauss's field work with the Indians, the tribal leader had noticed that Levi Strauss spent a lot of time writing, and he was intrigued by this. Um, so at one point, the, there was kind of a crisis in this mission, and tensions were high, so Levi Strauss decided to distribute paper and pencil to all of the Indians in this tribe, um, and just see what happened. Well. Um, over the, the next few days, he discovered that everyone was writing these long lines um, on these pieces of paper. They were, they were imitating the act of writing. Um, and when the time came for the gift exchange between Levi Strauss's Indians and the new groups that they had encountered, what happened was the chief of the tribe that Levi Strauss was with took the paper and began reading it 
as though he was reading a ledger of transactions saying, we're going to give this gift to you, and in exchange you will receive this. Now what Levi Strauss noticed about this moment was that what, what the chief had understood about the power of writing was that the person who controls the ledger controls the distribution of resources. And so Levi Strauss noticed that ledgers actually centralize power in the hands of the state. So remember, for the vast majority of human history, the vast majority of people have been illiterate. Um, so no, not only could they not read or write, but they couldn't keep accounts. So there was a specialized group, generally deployed by the state, to determine what the ground truth was, and they would interpret the ledgers. Now, this, this danger, the, the ledger, the centralized ledger as then the, the centralization of power is something that the blockchain has emerged in contradistinction to because the blockchain is a decentralized ledger. And I'm gonna explain now what I mean by that because a centralized ledger is not the only model in human history for how ledgers have worked socially. So next, I'm gonna take you to Micronesia, which is uh, uh, right off uh, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean here, this island of Yap. And it's very important for the history of blockchain technology. Here's why. So these are face stones. This is the unit of currency used by the people of Yap. It is a measure of wealth. Um, and these stones are stored over long periods of time and displayed. However, they are so heavy that people can't actually move them around and give them to each other. So in order to remember who owns which stone, which face stone, the entire village has to have a mental map of who gave the stone to whom at what time. So this is what we're looking at. This is a decentralized ledger where all of these people keep in their minds a list of transactions, a sender, a receiver, and the content. So which stone are we talking about? Who gave it to whom? And everybody keeps track of this. So if one person comes out and says, that's my stone, the entire village says, no, it's not. We all know that was given by this guy to that guy. It's not yours. And that is the power of a decentralized ledger. <clears throat> so one way you can imagine these face stones is as bitcoins. Bitcoins are, are digital versions of a face stone. And unlike a face stone, each bitcoin can be subdivided into 100 million little pieces. So not only do you have to transact, you don't have to actually transact the whole stone, you can transact a tiny piece of it. And so it's, it's using the decentralized ledger as a social technology, but it's making it very convenient and easy to use. That's the fundamental innovation of blockchain technology. And as you know, since the advent of Bitcoin, there have been many other types of blockchains that have arisen on this model, adapting it in different ways. So you can think of blockchains as a super ledger, that it's a new memory system for humanity that records transactions. And the question is, what does this ledger remember? So, you know, I, I, I've said already, transactions, transaction one, transaction two, transaction three. A chain is a sequence of transactions. And once a transaction has been made, you can't edit it, you cannot change it. This is why blockchains are considered a single source of truth, that you consult the blockchain to discover whether that transaction in fact took place, who it took place between, and when it took place, which is very important. So if we zoom in, what is exactly in this transaction? This is the actual data that is recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain. You have a sender, you have a receiver, and then you have content. So as you can see, this isn't really human readable. You can't tell who this sender is, you can't tell who this receiver is, and you can't really tell what that content is. That is by design, because when you have a public ledger that anyone can read, you also want to make sure that it protects privacy. And this is a fundamental innovation in the Bitcoin blockchain, that you're, you're creating an on-chain record, but in order to read this record, you have to actually link to data that's going to tell you what this is. And similarly with Ethereum, so, so this is what goes on the Ethereum blockchain. 
Just like Bitcoin, there's a sender, there's a receiver. There's an amount of cryptocurrency or tokens that is being transferred. But in addition, it also allows for smart contracts, which means you can encode transactions that self-execute on the chain itself. So these are two different models for encoding information on the blockchain. And I want to go back to our Kipu knots for a second, because as I mentioned earlier, we actually can't read these. And there's a reason why, because this was a ledger, but in order to read that ledger, you had to have some sort of key to understand what it was. And we've lost those keys now, um, in part because the keys were oral. There were experts whose entire job in Inca society was to preserve and interpret these ledgers for people. And after those experts died off, um, first due to warfare between other uh, Amerindian empires and then later because of Spanish colonization, we lost the historical keys to be able to interpret it. And this is a crucial point about how blockchains work because there's on-chain data and then there's off-chain data. And you can only read a blockchain if you can make a link between the data that is off-chain and the data that is on-chain. So off-chain data can be anything. It can be literally what's in somebody's mind, like, like the Kipu interpreter. It can be uh, a social reality. It can be a database that's stored somewhere. It can be your mobile phone. It can be your laptop. Any, any database that is stored off-chain um, can be linked to transactions on the blockchain. And that is what makes blockchains useful socially. So um, this is an example of one way to link off-chain data to on-chain data. And I'm gonna use the example of education certificates because this is what we do at Learning Machine. So we have developed an open source technology standard working with the MIT Media Lab to anchor certificates to the blockchain. But as I showed you earlier, this is the only thing that goes on the blockchain. The actual certificate doesn't go on the blockchain. So you have to link the blockchain data to the certificate. And that's what we do at Learning Machine. Um, this means that it's one way. It's like a, um, like a tinted window or a one-way mirror where if you're just looking at the blockchain, you can't see what that certificate is. But if you have the certificate, you can reference the blockchain to verify that it is authentic, that it has not been tampered with, that it was issued by the correct issuer and sent to the correct recipient. That is very powerful, and I will tell you why. This is a picture of two Syrian refugees. They're sitting on a beach, and they're literally drying their official documents behind them. Now, even if these documents survive and are not destroyed in the journey, if they take them to another country, Greece, Germany, Brazil, the United States, how will they verify that these documents are authentic? Currently, the only way to do that is to look at the document, see who, ask who issued it, and then call or write or email that issuer and say, did this person actually graduate from your university? Is this their real degree? Could you send us, you the issuer, send us a valid version of their degree? So they're not gonna take the document that the refugee presents, they'll only take the document that the issuer sends. What does this mean? Well, it means that in practice, we have over five million people in the world displaced, the most highly educated refugee population in history who cannot document their achievements. So we have doctors, lawyers, professionals, scientists who cannot practice their trade in their new countries. This is a massive loss of human capital, and it's a human tragedy for that person who invested a lifetime in education and has to start from zero. The blockchain prevents this from happening in the first place. If these people had their records as digital records that were anchored to the blockchain, they could reconstruct those records in the countries they end up in and prove not only that they're authentic, but that they were issued by that institution and that they were issued to them. This would save an enormous amount of time and money as well as increasing opportunity and access for the people who need it most. So I'll give you an example. MIT uses our technology to issue their diplomas. And last year, 
um, they had a graduate, an MBA graduate, who uh, took her blockchain certificate to the government of Mexico and applied for a job. They were able to verify her degree with one click, and she was able to circumvent the entire apostille process, which takes weeks, it's, it costs a lot of money, it's a pain, um, and it closes a lot of doors for people who can't get through that process. So we've just created access in an instant with free verification that used to be extremely daunting and time consuming. So not only do we have the problem of lost records, natural disasters, wars, but because it's so hard to verify credentials today, we have massive problems with fraud. So we know, for example, in the United States that over half of all PhDs that are awarded in any given year are just purchased. They're, they're fake. Um, and, and that proportion actually holds if you look at the world as a whole. Um, credentials are very easy to fake. Um, and not only do people fake their educational records, but even more so they fake their job history because it's even more valuable on the job market. So we know that something between like 20, 30 percent um, one, one uh, job search website told us they believe between 20-30% of the resumes on their website have some fake uh, credential on them. Um, but we know from additional research that over half of all people know someone who has uh, falsified some job experience on their resume. So this is just a, a really common problem. Um, and when it's detected, of course the fraud damages add up, but the vast majority of the time it's never detected at all. So, so this is the blockchain for education. Verifiable records that the individual recipient owns can take with them to any country in the world, have them instantly verified for free um, in a lifelong manner. So now you only need to receive your certificate once and you can share it an infinite number of times without ever worrying about fraud uh, or tampering with the certificate. And at this point, I want to turn it over to my colleague Alex to talk about how Malta has been using this technology. Okay, hi everybody. Um, listening to Natalie talk about ledgers reminded me of uh, my previous reincarnation. Um, I used to be a chartered accountant who got bored being a chartered accountant who then became a strategist for multinational companies who got bored doing that and set up my own consulting firm and then I got bored doing that. And I did a PhD on new media and I now teach and I advise the Minister for Education on anything which has to do with education technology and disruption in the way we inflict education on 21st century citizens and still using 20th century models. Um, as I speak right now, my son Jacob, age 15, is sitting an exam trying to get his first, one of his first credentials. So I, I also want to think of him as I'm going through this. Um, Malta, um, this is not a, a tourism you know, uh, poster. I mean, that's where, where I come from. And it says there, Malta has a legacy of uh, being an island lab. It's not dissimilar to uh, places like here where there are very limited resources and the country has to think out of the box. So I had broadband in Malta before my friends in Chiswick, London had broadband. Um, Malta saw a niche in the gaming sector when the US threw out offline casinos and, and created an online gaming sector. Um, seven months ago, the Prime Minister of Malta said that Malta has become a blockchain island. Um, irrespective of that, I think it's this combination of language, being small, being quick, being irrelevant sometimes on a geographical stage, but also being very strategic where we are. We are, you know, those of you who don't know where Malta is, we're very close to North Africa. We're European. We're on the migrant trail, so there are people who end up in Malta, um, having tried to escape from Syria and other places, and end up in Malta by accident, maybe trying to get a job in Italy. And because Malta's economy is thriving, some people actually go to Italy and then actually come back to Malta. So Malta has inbound migration. Um, my uh, approach to the blockchain was by accident, but there was a sense of purpose when I look at it in hindsight. Um, when I, about five years ago, when I got a phone call from, my, from the minister, who used to be my old English teacher, just as I was about to leave the country again and go and teach in England, and he said, just, you know, can you just help me for a while with a small project? The small project was called the National Lifelong Learning Strategy. So I spent about a year, by accident, by design, trying to find, identify new ways of getting institutions out of their comfort zone 
in terms of thinking that just because we, we dish out people in the academic you know, supply chain and we think that those guys are gonna find decent jobs or jobs which fill their lives with purpose, or if you end up being 50 and you get turfed out because you're no longer useful, we all of us have to find a way in the same way I have to reinvent yourself every five, six years. That's gonna be what's gonna happen to all our kids. And it's what I keep on telling my son. So National Lifelong Learning Strategy, what happened right about 2014. And plugging into that was again my interest in rethinking education. When I did my PhD, I guess I was sitting in Malta, my university was in the UK. I used to speak to my supervisor about once a week on Skype. I went up to England about 10 times. At the end of year one, my supervisor told me, you're going into areas I don't know where you're going, good luck. That was my PhD, yeah? And I got a PhD in three years, cum laude, but at the end of the day, Malta again saw a niche over there by saying, the future of education is gonna be very much plug and play. We're all gonna accumulate credits, whatever it is we're doing, from you know, my son's piano playing all the way to whatever he wants to do, um, being interested in history, and philosophy and other things which might not be very sexy these days, but which might become very useful in the future. Okay, so the framework for accreditation of digital education, we started looking at how can you look at new ways that people are learning online, and this took us on journeys to speak to the Coursera's and future learners of this world. Creating a foundation that I head up with the, with a, called the Commonwealth Center for Connected Learning. And somewhere along the line over here, I, I took a trip to MIT Media Lab to speak to Philip Schmidt, who was speaking here yesterday, and then got to know Dan Hughes, who heads up Learning Machine. And it was so, it, in a way, it was around about 2016 that I started plugging into these ideas of lifelong learning and accreditation of bits and pieces of credentials that you accumulate in life. And that's how we ended up trying to explore the blockchain. Fast forward to um, 2017, we signed an MOU with Learning Machine on a set of pilots that are now happening right now. So right now, um, there are the pilots in Malta are related to the Institute for Tourism Studies. All the graduates who come out of that um, institution now all have their certificates notarized on the blockchain. Um, you're looking at people at the VET University. Same thing is happening. Maybe the most, most interesting one is the National Commission for Further and Higher Education. Where that again has to deal with irregular migrants or people who come with missing credentials. And we're using the blockchain to not once that the due audit process has happened, that very symbolically this reconstructed credential gets notarized on the blockchain, blockchain forever. The whole purpose being that the blockchain is all about, the way we perceive it to be about self-sovereignty, immutability, transferring power essentially from the institution to the learner. That was very important. Here's what looks like a complicated slide. I'm just sharing this to you, uh, with, with you in terms of, it sounds very easy when you do a nation state application, but really what you end up doing is dealing with a lot of people and having to press a lot of buttons and trying to make these buttons react, okay? So if you have to look at the blockchain credential stakeholders, there's obviously the the entity, the techies, in this case, the learning machine that were working with MIT Media Lab, that were developed this open standard called Bloxerts. Note, an open standard. If it had not been an open standard, we would not have looked at it from our purpose, okay? But if you had to look where I was sitting there, so let's assume that Alex is sitting as the policymaker strategist over here. I had to engage with a whole raft of nation state stakeholders from the Ministry for Education in other words, that was the first crazy guy who said, let's look into this, who was the Minister for Education. And then that started a whole series of talking to people within EdTech committees, lawyers. Lawyers get very, you know, very excited and very worried when you start mentioning blockchain these days, okay? Especially at the time that the Prime Minister had, a, had said, we're gonna become a blockchain island, which meant that for many people, this equated to FinTech and FinTech regulation when I really wanted to operate under the radar, it still meant that at some stage, I had to have conversations with the office of the prime minister, which eventually meant that the data protection commissioner went, went in, which meant that the Ministry for Finance came in. And it was at that stage, ironically, while all this is happening, that we actually called the education institutions and we said, we've got something in it for you, we think, but really, there's something in it for learners. 
and eventually there's something in it for employers. So what do you have in green really are the way we perceive it, the key stakeholders really are, when you start, start talking about nation states, education institutions, the blockchain technology partner, the learners, and employers. What I've got over here is that human networks cannot be automated. If you want to get something done with technology, you've got to find like-minded people in key positions and find a way of getting across very simple messages. In our case, the simple message was, are we prepared in the 21st century to agree on a couple of things? One, the credential is not going to go away. My son, today, if he passes his exam, will get a piece of paper. And that's what he's going to show for something which at the moment is upsetting him, but which I hope will empower him one day. Okay. But the second thing, do we accept that in the same way when it came to me doing my PhD, and I had done my finance uh, chartered accountancy certification, I don't know, years before, I had to beg FCCA to send me my transcript of whatever so I could do a PhD when I'd long stopped being an accountant, I guess. This isn't going to happen anymore. Because whether you're doing Cisco training, where are you going to get a you know, 15, year old, 15 years old and you're getting your school leaving certificate? Everything is going to get notarized on the blockchain. Okay, so that's one thing you must never forget, I guess, human networks. So if you had to think an analogy of the world we live in, hence mobile phone, that's me and my son Jacob when he was very young, by the way. Okay, and, and all the yab yab that happens on social media and all of this big data stuff, which some of us engage with and some of us are worried about. I'm somebody who was a perennial optimist about the internet, having studied with people like Howard Rheingold. And if you see a lot of us oldies, I guess now, with some doubts we have about the various Facebooks and Googles of this world and what's happening to our data, okay? And if you had to think in terms of the cloud that we are trusting these days, okay? If you transpose this and think of blockchain somewhere over here and these actors over there, that's pretty much the way we're looking at it in Malta but I think we should look at it in terms of other small states. It is not an accident that the small countries will go with this first, by the way. If you try and implement this in large countries, there are a lot of fiefdoms within individual universities. You need illuminated leaders to press the right buttons. So I guess after Malta, it'll probably be the Bahamas or one of these countries that will do these kind of things. The Singapore's, I hope. Okay. Um, yeah, so crazy people, crazy technologies. Um, I'm going to share with you something which um, I spent quite a bit of time. While I was doing this process, the European Commission got to know that Alex was involved in this nation state pilot, and we developed what's becoming a report that has taken, a, in a way, a life of its own. Um, if you Google blockchain in education, European Commission, you will find a report that we lodged round about November last year. And this is really levering on the whole notion of self-sovereignty. It's quite a dense report. What I thought was going to be a couple of weeks of work ended up being seven months, simply because there's so much going on right now, from startups to nation states looking at pilots. Um, the Netherlands, for example, is one of those entities. But a couple of things that we suggested to try and kickstart this whole notion of self-sovereignty. One, in my case, I'm talking about the EU as a, as a block, okay? It could be any other block of nations, I guess. Okay, so we're saying we should direct all the EU and member state action towards the notion of an open ecosystem. So from our point of view, we're saying we've lost the internet 1.0. Just listen to what Tim Berners-Lee said last week, okay? There's a chance, again, if we really believe in this intermediation, okay, to get over the noise, okay, and empower, okay, learners, but using open systems, not necessarily hegemonic suppliers, okay? Two, we need to have some commonly agreed technical standards for these, what constitutes education credentials. Okay. The third one is that if you look at in Europe, and there must be other programs like this in other parts of the world, if you're looking at in, in Europe Erasmus Plus funding for stakeholder projects, it should become the norm that these should be built on open standards. A lot of money gets wasted on things that end up being very closed for a finite number of suppliers and consultants. Fourthly, we're saying that the EU should now look at an advisory blockchain group as an advocate for this chance that we have in 2018 and beyond to do something concrete. Fifthly, we should try and fund 
examples of good practice online curricula on the blockchain. There are a lot of us who are active in things like Creative Commons, have been talking about open education for many years. It makes one hell of a difference when you get a child and say, here's your phone, here's your curriculum, you've now passed this, here's your certificate. Activate your private key, your certificate is notarized. Natalie used the same example about that graduate that then went on okay, in Mexico. We can, it's not just a question of time, it's a question of empowerment. Um, yeah, what's happening now? Things which are buzzing in our head right now. One, will learners see value in the blockchain? The oldest thing there is, will young people see this? From what we're seeing, because kids are finding it so easy to actually get the phone, oh, that's how it works. Oh, now I can share it on Facebook. Or I can share not just my transcript or little bits of it with a future employer. So that's one of the first questions we need to ask ourselves over the next couple of months. Will employers see value? We're only starting right now to engage with a finite number of employers who have traditionally said that what academia is churning out is necess not necessarily what they need in terms of skill sets. So we hear a lot about 21st century skills, the need for critical thinking, all of this kind of stuff. Will these credentials end up also being notarized on the blockchain? Thirdly, will open standards become the norm? I don't know. There are a lot of people who are waiting for Microsoft, Sony, IBM to do something. Okay. Fourthly, how quickly can the pilot that we're doing scale up? Now, I'm talking about a small nation state, and it's a no-brainer that you can go from education credentials to health credentials to public registries to police records, whatever it is. Okay. All of these are credentials. I'm going to leave you with one slide and something I remember. One, just a simple plug, for those of you who are interested in the blockchain, credentials, and connected learning, there's a conference which I'm coordinating on the 17th and 18th of May in Malta. It's run by a foundation, which is non-profit. It would be good if some of you guys turn up. And the last thing is I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of what Simon Sharma said this morning about memory and power and how memory contributes to power. If you substitute memory with credentials, that's pretty much what we're talking about here. That's the potential that we have right now to activate the blockchain and put it to good use. Okay, so that's it. So um, it looks like we're a little over time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, we, we may need to skip our Q&A since we're a little bit over time, but anyone who, uh, first of all, that's our contact information, so feel free to take a picture. Um, we're also going to be at the Block Certs booth, which is literally right around the corner behind you. So if anyone wants to chat with us one-on-one, -on -one, please come see us now. Thank you.